All right. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people turning up tonight. And uh, we are in Japan and uh, this is the Tokyo session of uh, the journey of Mira Mijli's Biscuit Tin. And uh, just very quickly for those of you who are not up to date, this project is, um, I think it grew out of a wonderful project, the In Parenthesis project, which has been started by Claire McCone and Rachel uh, Wiesmeisman. And it deals with five fantastic female philosophers from Britain. And one of them was Mary Midgley. And um, this project sees Midgley's biscuit thin travel around the world in 12 locations. And in each location, a philosopher and a poet have a little conversation about some topics that were important for Mary in her philosophical work. And tonight I'm here with uh, Yasuhiro Yotsumoto, a uh, Japanese poet in Yokohama at the moment. Am I right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Very good, very good. And my name is Ishtan Zardari. Konbanwa. <laughs> my name is Ishtan Zardari. I'm a philosopher and I'm uh, talking to all of you from Hamamatsu right now. So. We are going to discuss some aspects of uh, Mary Midgley's work. And Mary was a philosopher. She passed away two years ago at the age of 99 after a fantastic life. And maybe there are three key things I would mention uh, about her. One is her fantastic love for her family. If you read her autobiography, uh, Minerva's All Out, um, she describes her family very lovingly, and I think that sets the tone for her whole life. The other thing is that she has been one of a generation of uh, very, very talented philosophers who grew up and was trained at Oxford in the 1940s. And um, she was good friends with Philippa Foote, Mary Warnock, Elizabeth Anscombe, and Iris Murdoch. They were at Oxford at the same time. And um, what the In Parenthesis project, our parent project, is trying to show is that there are several interesting and exciting connections between their work that go beyond just uh, chance. And um, so the third thing I would want to mention about her is that her work addresses um, many issues which are of interest to people beyond philosophy. And she engaged very prominently with protecting and caring for the environment. environment. Um, and I think this is a profoundly important, one of the profoundly important messages of her work overall. So I recommend you all to, uh, for those who haven't yet read her works, to engage with her. And um, so we are going to first, Yasuhiro and I, we're going to have a little discussion about some core topics in Mary's um, work. And uh, after that, we will open up the floor and people will be able to ask some questions. And we will also have the chance to listen to two of Yasuhiro's poems. So with that, I would actually, um, I think it's time to get into it. So um, the first topic we are going to talk a little bit about is um, Mary's conception of philosophy and poetry. And she had a very interesting uh, metaphor about philosophy's role for society saying that it, uh, she compared it to plumbing. <laughs> and um, the idea, I think, as far as I understand it, is that um, Plumbing is essential for our lives. We need clean water and we need good plumbing for everything to uh, work well. But we don't notice this fundamental underlying structure of our everyday, um, everyday. And we only notice it when it goes wrong. And so philosophy is similar in that it can keep our conceptual, the, the underlying conceptual structures of our life healthy, it can sort out problems with these. Uh, but people don't notice the need for philosophy when the conceptual problems that create real problems in our lives are not apparent. 
And there is an interesting connection she points out with poetry. And I was wondering if uh, Yasuhiro, you could say some things about uh, what you thought about mm. what Mary said here about poetry. Well, actually, I had never met any philosopher in my life until I met you a couple of summer ago in, uh, in Yokohama. And, uh, come, and of course, I never heard about Mary Michelet until then. And it was such a fresh surprise to find how actual her writing was when I, you know, eventually started to uh, read her writings. I thought all philosophers are very conceptual and with a messy hair, um, but her writing is very actual, dealing with the real stuff. And she seems to hate a dogmatic approach to, a, um, to any matter that she embraces pluralism. And, and I found it very similar to poetry. The, the poetry is the language of and as opposed to or. It tries to combine two different things, light and darkness or life and death. It, it that, whereas a logical language tries to uh, dissect it and uh, um, but uh, um, her um, it's, it's interesting that her way of using the language is very logical it's like a um, a divorce lawyer uh, who mercilessly attacks the other side of a, a marriage couple but what she's fighting for is this poetic view of the world, of this pluralism. So it's a, it's a very unique combination to me that I found a poet in a, um, a very prose, a logical uh, way of thinking. So to me, she is a prose poet. Oh, that's fantastic. And I really like that you mentioned the lawyers, because that's one of the things Mary also mentions that besides being a little bit like a plumber, philosophers are also like lawyers mm. and they can overdo it. They can get lost in technical arguments and debates, mm. but they can also be a little bit maybe like a lawmaker, right? Uh, they, they can also systematize sensible mm ideas in this logical way that you mentioned. Mm. So this kind of interesting duality is there. Right. I think she says at some point that the really great philosophers, like maybe Plato, Aristotle, they have this kind of combined mm. these poetic, but also lawyer-like qualities in their work. Yeah, she um, can be a defense lawyer for poets. <laughs> that would be maybe useful. <laughs> and so, Based on, based on these ideas, we started talking about poetry and the role of poetry. And I, I remember at the beginning, I had a very instrumental idea about poetry. And I think this was a fantastic uh, opportunity for me to, to rethink this quite simple stance that I had. Um, and in some ways, um, you seem to have grasped Midgley's idea, I now think a little bit better. Like, uh, would, you, would you tell a, a little bit about what your vision of poetry is? Um, well, I um, want to quote Gary Sh uh, Snyder's short poem, which says, it comes blundering over the Buddhas at night. It stays frightened outside the range of my campfire. I go to meet it at the edge of the light. So to me, poet, poetry is something like a badger. Uh, it's very sensitive. It um, hides in the darkness and you got to be very patient and uh, careful to meet it. In fact, I don't think I have ever seen it, but uh, having 
been writing poetry for you know almost four decades i i think i have sensed it getting fairly close to the range of the light mm. that's a very very interesting uh, vision and so i think it leads to, th this is a nice place where we can connect maybe our next main talking point beastliness uh, because you mentioned that there's something interesting about poetry which you like into a badger right and so May, one of one of Mary's main interests was human nature, but humans as animals and our animal nature and the nature of animals. So she wrote a book uh, titled Beast and Man. And um, Yasuo and I read this book. And uh, the main idea I think of that book is that um, throughout history, humans have very often um, played an unfair trick on animals. Namely, they took all their own negative uh, properties and qualities and projected this onto animals. And they created this notion of the beastly, the bees. And um, Midgley in the book shows very convincingly that there are many, many, many references in philosophy, historical works to all kinds of animals as beasts and all kinds of attributes um, like being evil, um, being prone to excess, these are attributed to them, being malicious, um, cruel. And uh, what Mijmi tries to show is that actually people um, tried to get rid of their own bad sides in this, in this cheeky uh, way through this trick. And what did you think about the book or what was what were mainly maybe some ideas that you, you that resonated mm. the, first of all um when you first contacted me which is almost two years ago i think you um wrote that we could pick up uh, some main topic and one of one of them was instinct yeah. And uh, we agreed to deal with that. But at that time, being a Japanese and the, uh, not a native English speaker, I somehow confused instinct with intuition. And, and all along, for the first uh, several months, I was thinking that we are going to talk about um, intuition, which to me is the central part of writing a poem. And I realized, when I realized that we are actually indeed talking about instinct, and it's this book about beast and a man, I felt really a bit panicked. I, I, I thought, oh, what uh, am I going to talk about instinct? I, I am interested in um, intuition, but uh, I have no idea what instinct is. But as I go along, went along, I, I found the book fascinating. And, and first of all, her she made such a um, an effort and the uh, strategic uh, discussion to really convince this fact that man is an animal. We are part of this the whole animal world which to me is such a matter of course that that um, Japan, as you know, Istvan is a, a country of uh, animism and the, uh, the, we see little goals in every little animals. You go to shrine everywhere and there is always fox and uh, little snake there. And uh, there is also this Buddhism um, influence in our culture. So people naturally talk about reincarnation, that uh, you must be uh, a monkey in your former life. And I, my zodiac is a wild boar. Um, and the people like a certain temper of me to, ah, there you go, you uh, this, uh, the pig uh, mentality, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, so, the um, 
that her her point itself is not a surprise to me at all. But the way she tries to convince her colleagues into that uh, con conclusion is eye opening. That I I thought I have seen uh, the way philosopher argues for the first time. It's so um, systematic, so strategic. Uh, it, it's a joy. So even though I just said it's a it's a contradiction. Even though I said that uh, being a part of the animal is no surprise to me. Still, after reading her book, I I was really eye opening and, and wow, I am animal. <laughs> she uh, really convinced me. Yeah, I, I really like your, um, what you say that maybe the, the idea wasn't so revolutionary. I think many of us who have read uh, Aristotle or who have a more naturalistic mindset these days, also in, uh, in Europe or in the US, um, treat this as, as a pretty self-evident idea that we are animals. Um, but um, I liked, for example, very much that um, the way she argued was she made use of a lot of recent results in ecology, in um, anthropology, and um, she was working with science and uh, to, to show, to make sense of this in a very humane way. And um, one of the points that was very, very interesting for me was that she emphasized that often actually animals have, uh, have more regulated lives and more rule following lives, lives that follow fixed patterns than humans do. And um, she had this interesting discussion there about instincts, right? Open instincts and closed instincts. And one of the things yeah. that she mentions is that our open instincts, in the case of humans, they they're very, very open and they enable us to alter and change our behavior in so many different ways. Um, that, I, I found that a very fascinating discussion and, uh, and maybe one where it really shows that it is worthwhile for philosophers to have a vision um, and to engage science, but not just blindly to follow what people in ethology or people in anthropology say. Um, and this kind of vision creating quality of the book is, I think, remarkable as well. I, I, I very much enjoyed this. Uh, besides, I'm a big lover of animals, so, um, well, of course. <laughs> I, I, I also like uh, her discussion about uh, closed versus open uh, instinct. So, you know, to so make a circle complete uh, from this uh, intuition to instinct, by the time I finished reading that book, I was really asking myself, is poetry or writing poems a instinct for us humans? Is it a uh, closed instinct or open instinct? <laughs> what do you think, Istvan? Well, yeah, at first I, I was very baffled by this. But then you recommended me that wonderful book about uh, language and magic. That's right, Izutsu Toshihiko. Toshihiko mm. Izutsu. Mm. And, um, and um, it's a delightful book and I didn't know what to expect. It, I mean, it's mainly anthropology and sociology, but he makes a very interesting case, right? That, um, that many of our first instances as human, human beings historically were probably about magic and we tried to bring about all kinds of outcomes by ritualizing language and engaging right. in language use. And, um, yeah. and there he argues in the book that a lot of our current language use patterns are just leftover. That's right. yes. <laughs> we're still yes. using language in all these interesting ways uh, yeah. to influence others. Um, and now it works because it mm -hmm. became convention or tradition it didn't mm. necessarily work at the beginning when it, it, it was a bit more like magic. It's mm. very interesting. Uh, and I found that, yes, yeah, this, this, in this sense, our languages and maybe poetry as well has an instinctive quality that we try to affect things around us um, as agents. Right. And, and as long yeah. as we don't have a very um, naturalistic or science-influenced uh, world of the view, 
we might think that we influence a lot more than, mm. than what most people think maybe they influence today through their actions. Um, and maybe this, this, um, mm. these exercises of agency that we try to alter our environment to, to fit us, that, that might, that's definitely something instinctual, I think. So yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. we get back yeah. to this, yeah. yeah. And, and I think this, um, I, mm. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and I, I, I think definitely this poetic imagination is so deeply rooted in our intelligence, in our consciousness that um, I, I like to call it an instinct that any human if not writing actual poems, but uh, the enjoying this uh, poetic imagination, um, almost a closed uh, instinct. But uh, at the same time, um, coming back to this beastliness and we, a, an animal, um, I think we are very unique. Um, compared with all the other animals in that, that we use this um, symbolic language or we use language in such a symbolic way as opposed to more direct or um, a language of designation, uh, simply pinpointing this is a banana. But our language is almost cursed with association mm. and the uh, imagination and it, it goes out of control of rationality. And, and that may be a quite a distinct difference between a human and the rest of the animals. Yeah, and this brings us, uh, this brings us to our third topic that we wanted to address, right? Irrationality. And you said this was also something that you were very interested in these days. Um, and and I, I was looking at Mary's book, Science and Poetry, and um, she writes there about this interesting relationship between science and poetry. And she's suggesting ways in which um, these two, these can be seen as two approaches to how we can see the world, that they complement each other, they don't fight each other. And she writes something that I found very interesting about the romantic. Um, she writes that what Blake objected to was single vision, the inability to look at things from any angle other than the scientific one. It was not Newton's discoveries themselves. All the great romantics made this effort to bring both sides together, which is just what makes them great. And I found this very interesting that, um, that, um, she emphasizes that there is this irrationality and the role of the imagination here, but that can actually help us to see more. It's not something that science should replace. And um, I was wondering, so when, mm. when, you, when we started um, talking, you mentioned that you think irrationality has a big part in, in writing poetry as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we've been kind of talking about it all along this evening, but um, the logical language, such as Mary's so um, skillfully used to convince uh, her opponents, um, dissects this chaotic world and the uh, layout each piece in the logical order, along with a time sequence. That's the ordinary language, that's the logical language. Um, and, I, and I think the poetic language goes the other way. It tries to break up that linear um, sequence and conjure up all the pieces back into the whole. And, uh, and this is where this magical element of the language comes in. The language is basically a very 
rational being. It's, it has the meaning, it has the logic, it has the grammar, but uh, somewhere along with these rational and logical element or aspects, uh, there is a, this magical power which brings back and um, reinvent the, the wholeness, um, which as soon as we utter this logical language is broken into all the pieces, but it somehow brings it back. And uh, that's the, uh, to me, the opposite direction of rationality. And the, uh, the poet somehow tries to um, manipulate that. And, uh, and, and this is what uh, Mary talks about when, um, you know, she praises the uh, ethologist's approach of not um, put everything in one argument or in one theory, but rather uh, see each pieces and try to put it in their own respective context and see certain connection in between them. It brings the pieces together. And that's what a poet does. Uh, see a feather and a stone and, and somehow it brings them together. Mm. to see a very fresh uh, new beginning of the yeah yeah i i totally agree with you that that there's um this maybe this connects us nicely to the last topic that we we wanted to very briefly address um, namely how this all relates in, in Mary's view to science and a scientific understanding of the world. And I think it's very interesting in the, um, both in the Beastliness book and in the science and poetry book that she emphasizes several times that of course nobody should have any problem with all the discoveries and all the understanding that science has provided us with. It's more just an issue of extending some methods which were successful in science, for example, in physics, which individualize every phenomena and break it down into smaller, more simple, easier to understand or better observable phenomena. And that's how we learn more and more and more. And she notes that sometimes these days, people, even in philosophy, seem to think that this is the best way to get to know what humanity is, uh, what our moral problems are, what our political problems are, and how we should solve these. And of course, it might work for some problems. Um, there's nothing wrong with looking at economic data and analyzing carefully every situation. But in the end, um, we need some kind of vision and we need some kind of motivation and values among which to, uh, along which to to organize society and that can help us move on or, or solve our problems and, uh, and structure our life in ways that are beneficial for human beings. And that calls for this unified whole view. Um, I, think, I think that's a very interesting takeaway in her book. Um, and I, I found it very rewarding to uh, read it in a, in a way that she touched it in a very accessible way, supported by a lot of examples. So I think this brings us roughly to, to the, the end of the time that we allocated to ourselves to um, sort of introduce these topics and some of Mary's ideas, some of our own ideas about them. And before we open up the floor to, to the audience to ask questions or, or to share their ideas with us, I would ask Yasuhiro to read out one of, uh, one of his poems. And um, you wrote these poems while and after reading Mary, right? Actually, literally, I, I go to a riverside in Munich where I used to live uh, up until March this year. And the, uh, I read um, almost every afternoon uh, Mary's uh, big book, but in between I wrote um, 
some poems, and this is one of them. So I read. セール問いかけるのも言葉。星はただまたたくだけ。心は刻々体から溢れてゆく。意味の十六に抗って生きとし生けるものの無言化に誘われて。牛の下と人の耳のわずかな隙間に名付けられないが隠れている。Right, thank you so much. Uh, it was fantastic to hear it in the original. And I, just for the benefit of for those of us who don't, uh, don't, who are not fluent in literary Japanese, I'll read out the English uh, translation. And so the title is St. Luke's Cow. Ears wet with the cow's breath, its long tongue talking about the world. This world where cows eat grasses in silence and men are busy naming things. His hands swiftly jot down every one of those words, though hardly understanding a thing. Where do these words come from? It is also words that ask such a question. Stars just twinkle without words. Moment by moment, hearts flow out of the body, breaking away from the gravity of meaning, tempted by the wordless songs of all the living creatures. In a tiny space between the cow's tongue and the man's ear, hides the unnameable laughing soundlessly. Right. Definitely food for thought. And I love this poem. And we chose it in discussion partly because I think it illustrates your Ars Poetica very well and uh, also some of the ideas uh, by Mary. Um, mm. So we have now about um, 20, 25 minutes left. And uh, I would like to invite the audience to contribute if they have been inspired to any ideas if they have any questions or any insights that they want to share with us, uh, just keep in mind that uh, the recording will go, will continue. So you will be uh, recorded and your contribution will be later shared on the notes from a biscuit inside if you, uh, if you speak up. And you can uh, type your questions maybe perhaps in the chat first and then Claire will, um, Claire will act as chair and she will call on people to make their contributions and speak up. Thanks a million. I absolutely, uh, I was moved by your words. Yashihiro, that poem was really moving. Thank you very much. Um, okay, everyone. So if you just, if you have questions or you have comments or you just like to express, uh, your appreciation for the poem and um, you could type something in the chat and I can just call on people um, or yeah because I think that's probably the best way to do it um, yeah is there anything already there that I mean, uh, maybe I'll... no there's no there's no one there but perhaps they will type things uh, now I mean I, I might I might something really struck me that you said um, at one point, Yashihiro, he said that, you know, you, you, kn you knew that you were an animal before you read Mary's work. You know, Japan is very, sort of, or animism is very much woven into the culture. But you said that somehow after you read the book, it opened your eyes and you thought, wow, I'm an animal. And I think, like, I've had that, <laughs> I've had that phenomenology as well. 
and that thought uh, in a different context where I've, like, of course I know I'm an animal, of course I know that, but sometimes it's really brought home to you that really you are, <laughs> yes, you are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, and I just think in some ways there's lots of things that we know, but that we don't, uh, uh, that are not rounded beliefs in us. They're not really deeply held. Um, or they're not, so that kind of, that experience you had where you had, you know, wow, I am an animal. I think like that's almost like the holy grail. Like how do we, how do we make beliefs that we already have real in that way, kind of really mm -hmm. active in that way? Um, mm -hmm. And I know, yeah, well, I, I mean, I just wanted to say how struck I was by yeah, that. Yeah, Poetry can help with that somehow. To, to me, it, it's the 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 the, uh, the benefit of having a totally new channel of thinking. Mm -hmm. To me, you know, I, I knew that I was an animal, but in a certain way, in a quite intuitive way, I think. But Mary led me through this very clear uh, and illustrative. Um, the process of um, demonstrating how and why I am an animal. And so even though the conclusion is the same, the path to get there is a completely different channel. Maybe this is my first exposure to philosophical, yeah. uh, the approach of, of the matter, but that's a new experience and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting because I think mine was the other way around. I think I really believed it, but yeah, I maybe. didn't like. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have a I have a question. Um, uh, Ian, can you put your yeah? Ian is ready with the question. Can you ask your question, oh. Ian, James Kidd? Hi everyone. Can, can you hear me, Claire? I yeah, can. Yeah, can yeah. everyone hear Ian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah. I, a question for Yasuhiro. I'm thinking of the the wonderful Japanese Buddhist poet Isa. Many of mm. his verses, um, of course, mm. feature animals. And I'd like to hear a little more from you about how um, Buddhist poetries could be ways of cultivating our imagination, our empathy, and our sensitivity to animals. Mm. Mm. Um, yes, Isa is one of the most famous Isa. Uh, poem in, in his case it, this is haiku is yare utsu na hai ga te o suru ashi o suru maybe shoko san you can translate it but uh, it simply says uh, don't hit that fly it's uh, doing this gesture uh, begging you to spare his uh, life and I read um, very similar poem written by William Blake that uh, he was about to hit a fly to death and then he realized that oh this fly is me I am a fly enjoying this moment of life uh, and maybe someday some hand would hit me to nothingness uh, and and, and I, I was so surprised that the, uh, the, the, the sensitivity towards a little animal is so similar between Issa who lived in, uh, what, 18th century uh, Japan and William Blake in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, there is this Buddhism uh, and Zen uh, element in the uh, Issa's part, but I think it goes beyond that uh, Buddhism element. It's quite universal and very deep in our uh, minds. Because when you say about this animal element in Japanese poems, the first thing, the first poem that came to my mind is actually older than Issa. It's a uh, Heian era, so 10th century, something like that. A woman 
poet by the name of Izumi Shikibu saying that I want to see you so much, but I can't see you. And she's talking to the lover and he, um, flying on the on a little river. And she says, that's me, that's my soul coming out of me. Um, and the, um, so this interchangeability between um, you as a human and animal through some invisible thing that we call soul. Um, and in Japanese, it's uh, tama or tamashi. Uh, and the tamashi um, has a particular verb in the Japanese old um, poetry that it says akugaru. It's literally the use your limbs, the, the hands and um, legs to crawl out of your body so that it reaches a certain eternity uh, free from your dying body. Um, and, and that came to me. Sorry, and I'm not really talking about Buddhism poem, but uh, those are the thoughts that came to me upon your uh, question. Great, thank you so much. So we have a question from uh, Shez um, in the audience there. So uh, I don't know if Shez is there. Shez is oh, unmuted. That's great. <laughs> Ask and oh, yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> I always struggle on Zoom. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, this, I should say, Sheridan is Mary's grandson, so we're really lucky to have him here. So. Oh, well, <laughs> it's great to have you guys doing this. Um, and yeah, always great to hear my grandmother being discussed from the other side of the world. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's a really great discussion. I, I really, I really liked it. Um, I just um, your observation of um, Mary as a lawyer defending poetry. I thought that was a really interesting way of kind of um, way of framing it. I, I was just wondering if you wanted to expand any more on that on that thought and um, and what might be at stake. What she's kind of yeah, how important it is to defend that. <laughs> so thank you. You know what? Yes. Um, well. In, in in terms of the the contents, she's really on our side, the poet's side. Um, but the way she elaborated on that, and especially the way she attacks uh, against some of her enemies, was, was really fierce. Uh, so fierce that to uh, sometimes it was annoying. I was you know, reading her books in this really peaceful atmosphere on the riverside and, uh, but her fury and her fierce attack penetrates uh, the pages and come to me. And that was the time uh, when I saw this uh, movie called Marriage Story, uh, Scarlett Johansson and the, uh, uh, Adam Saman was there. Have you seen it? The movie, it's about the divorce battle. And the uh, Lola Dan uh, plays the, uh, the divorce lawyer um, on the side of uh, Johalex, uh, the Scarlett Johansson. And she was so tough and so fierce. And the, uh, somehow in my mind, um, Mary on this side and the uh, Lola Dan's defense lawyer um, connects uh, just a silly uh, talk, but um, but the that's uh, the most in a serious way that uh, I sometimes dream that uh, the poetry or the poetic imagination should be really placed at the center of our society and um, policy making when I think of the environmental issue or um, the recent uh, rise of uh, um, neo-fascism uh, politicians or the widening gap between have and have not. But uh, we need somebody like Mary to 
really combine this poetic imagination, the actual world, the, you know, because the poets after all are, are poets and they have really no direct influence on the day-to-day -day reality, um, at least for the short term. So um, I, I, I wish that the people will carry on her spirits and her approach. And I, and I think um, UK um, should be very proud of um, having utilized her insights and thinking in the, uh, the public uh, policy making in the past, actually doing it. Uh, I, I don't think that has ever happened in Japan and I, I really admire that. Thanks so much, Yashihiro. So we have a question um, for maybe uh, uh, Esteban, you might answer it um, from Anna Barandala. Anna? Yes, unmute, unmute, sorry. Um, hello, yes, so I was, I was interested in um, actually in um, Yasuhiro's um, characterization of poetry as looking for connections, looking for ants, for conjunctions of things. Um, and I find that very intriguing, but I, but I can't quite put my finger on what exactly you mean. And I wonder whether you could say something more about it, perhaps in contrast with the kinds of things that say philosophy and, and science do. So philosophy, you might think, um, looks for um, logical or conceptual connections between things. Science looks for causal connections between things. Mm. Looks at it that way. What kinds of uh -huh. things, what kinds of connections is it that poetry looks for? Thank um, you. Yeah, well, Anna, uh, no. I have to, <laughs> I, I have to uh, <laughs> um, answer that uh, as a poet. So it's not uh, really logical. And, uh, but you see, my father died uh this september and uh, i was so lucky that i came back to japan uh in spring uh and really stay here for the first time in 30 years uh, but because of this uh, pandemic i was not allowed to be with him all the time only half an hour per day uh and i travel to where he lives and and that's how i spent the whole summer and um when I heard that he has a terminal cancer uh, earlier in the in the spring, um, he died in me. That I cannot, I couldn't help seeing him in in the hospital without thinking that oh, this man is going to die. I mean, there's no way. Um, so, but he was there, and I lived this summer um, with sometimes away from him, half an hour in some days with him and always seeing him both as a dead man and a very very live person right in front of me and and this is end that i'm talking about in the material world you have to be either alive or dead and being dead is a bad thing that we have to do anything in order to live but uh in the dimension of poetic imagination, um, it does not go into that binary opposition. It's, it's there, like this uh, Schrodinger's cat in a box uh, in the quantum theory, that we talk about science and the classic Newton science um, goes into that binary um, categorization. But the, the quantum physics now says that the things overlaps, the possibility or the probabilities always overlap. And the, it's a matter of chance, uh, which uh, side of the probability turns out. And even if this side shows up, there is always the other side. To me, that is the poetic reality. That is what we would like to carry. And coming back to my father, he passed away in September and I could not, sh still can't um, shake this feeling off that he's still there. 
and he is there. Um, so, you know, before this summer, to me, it's life or death. Mm -hmm. But now it's life and death as a, as a son, but as a poet, I think I have known it all along by writing poem. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, I mean, that really resonates, but I you struggle, can I push you a little? So I struggle, <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't struggle, maybe I should just be content with ignorance or just with a kind of sense of mystery, but let me see. So I just want to know what kind of plane that operates on. Because I mean, one might wanna be tempted to say, oh, it's an emotional plane poetry, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the causal or the logical or philosophy of science. But it seems to me that that doesn't do justice, that it's more than that. It's not just sheer emotions. There's, there's, there's a lot more going on. Um, I mean, should we even perhaps try to, to kind of delineate what that spectrum is? Or, 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 sh or should we just, you know, embrace the mystery? Well, you what say you delineate think? and the... Um... I always think that language of poetry is circular, whereas the uh, you know logical language is is linear. It delineate. It makes a circle, and uh, I'm convinced that it's not imag imagination. It is the true state of this world. We mm -hmm. tends to deviate into. Uh, rationality and the uh, things that things are black and white and um, the and only um, something that you can touch exists but I think it's, it's, that is just rather the uh, emotional approach that's the fantasy the reality is um, the other way yeah that's that's thank really you so much thank you <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's a, yeah, that's incredible. Um, yeah, we Anna and I were talking a few uh, weeks ago about Cora. There's a philosopher called Cora Diamond who has a paper called "The Difficulty of Reality," and I think it connects a little bit with what you're saying. Um, we have some interesting questions. Uh, thank you. So Daryl uh, would like to make a comment. Uh, <clears throat> hi, can you see me? Uh, I had a problem with my computer, but is it okay now? Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me okay as well? Okay. Yes. Um, well, Mary was my tutor at university for three years, and um, we kind of got to know each other a little bit. She was always very warm and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful person. If you had any problems, you always went to Mary. Mary was great. And just something somebody said before, which was about this bringing together of opening things up and wanting to bring things together. You know, she was the only, this is in the seventies, you know, she was the only woman uh, philosopher in the department, in the philosophy department <clears throat> at Newcastle. And also she, the rest of the department were very much sort of Wittgensteinian that, and that strain, often very strain of, uh, that strain of Wittgensteinian thought, which is sort of, we can solve problems through language. And Mary, Mary stood against that and she wanted to open things up. She wanted to, let's bring in everything. And one of the, other, one of the things she did, which was great was she spoke a lot about continental philosophy. You know, she always brought Sartre and Beauvoir and, and Camus. She always brought things into her lectures, into her talks. And this was great for us because, um, you know, it opened philosophy up. And this thing also about, um, um, you know, s science, religion, everything can come into philosophy and philosophy can come into everything. So there's a kind of unity to the world. Um, so she really stood out in the department as, as the person who um, wanted to break through, didn't want to close things, didn't want to classify or categorize things. She wanted the human aspect of philosophy. And mm -hmm. as young students, we were very, very enthusiastic about that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, um, very much, I remember having a discussion with a fellow, fellow student about um, um, the way you said that um, in beasts, I think in beasts of man, as someone just said, that she gives all these, as this fan was saying, she gives to all the negative aspects of man to beasts. So I remember speaking, saying, well, you know, how, how in Feilbach's book in the 19th century, her essence of Christianity, he says all the good things about man have been given to God. And, um, you know, what Mary was doing was trying to recapture all this stuff and saying, and seeing, seeing, seeing man as a much greater and wider and more um, beautiful thing than uh, any of these things can, can be described. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that comment, uh, um, throw that spanner Thanks, in the works, so to speak. Uh, Esteban, you. do you want to respond or say something or do, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, yeah, very Based nice. On your reading. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think Daryl Daryl points out some really uh, important things in Mary's work, and I I really um, love that bit about the beauty of humans. That um, you know there is something about humanity that isn't captured if you only look at it from psychology. If you only look at it from medicine, if you only look at it from, um, I don't know, economics. And we need that kind of complicated, uneasy unity where things won't line up in one neat picture where we'll have the boxes, oh, okay, so this is how the medicine box connects with the physics box and that connects with the ethics box. That's, I think, not Mary's picture. Uh, her, her picture is that there, is no such bo- there are no such boxes. Uh, but with all that complexity, we have to be a lot more open-minded and just sort through it again. And what we'll end up with is going to be this much more fascinating, much more vulnerable um, being, but also a lot more potential. Um, and I, I, I think that connects to the previous question nicely because her, her goals, um, how she defines what philosophy and poetry can do um, there is this capacity to go beyond pointing out connections. To point out connections, you need to make the divisions, you need to have the fragmentation. But actually, we want to have like an interesting unified vision that we can aspire to, that can move us forward, that can help us to get out of the, uh, the deadlocks that we get into. If we, only, if we think politics is just having a good economy, we're stuck. We're not getting anywhere. And that's what we see in many ways now, right? Like defunding healthcare, defunding schools, it's not working. Um, So we need these more messy views which are willing to engage with all the topics that come in. Um, And it's not gonna be simple, but it, um, it opens up chances to have a fresh vision. I I think that's- Yeah, messy views are- (laughs) Oh, good. And there's two, we, we're kind of running out of the time for the discussion, but there's, there's at least two comments um, that I think we should uh, touch on, or th- three, in fact. Um, so there's uh, Masashi Kazaki. I don't know if uh, you are unmuted, but maybe we could hear from you, please. Oh, yeah. So it's me. Thanks. Um, oh, yeah, my okay. comment is pretty simple. Uh, what um, uh, Mary is suggesting is quite interesting, but I think... Um, there is a group of philosophers before Mary who had a very similar view on poetry. For example, uh, Mary, uh, sorry, uh, Margaret Cavendish, uh, she argued against Descartes' skepticism by saying, uh, science is just one way to have knowledge. Poetry is another way to gain knowledge about the world. The difference between science and um, poetry is, how to put it, for, for uh, Cavendish. Um, poetry enhances our ability and sensitivity to our experience. So in that regard, science is different from poetry, but both are ways to you know, acquire more knowledge about the world. I.A. Richards, uh, and a famous um, um, Cambridge um, philosopher working on um, 
poetry and literature criticism had a very similar view. So it seems to me in England, at least, uh, this is this tradition of philosophy who sort of emphasizes a very um, experience enhancing or experience organizing aspect of poetry. And uh, Mary Majorly belongs to this tradition. Of course, they are working independently. So uh, I found this quite fascinating. Thank you so much, Estvan. Do, do or Yoshihiro, do you have anything to add there? Or? I find this very creative, uh, and um, I, I'm a bit. Mm, I would have to look at the Cavendish account in more detail, like what she means by enhancing. So I think that can be understood mm -hmm. in different ways, right? Like learning more about the kind of things that that science deals with anyway. Or is this enhancing in a way that it complements or makes it more um, multifaceted? It gives more aspects to it, more well-rounded. So I think depending on which way of enhancement Cavendish has in mind, this might this might um, fit Mary's view nicely as well. Um, but yeah, certainly, I think there is a. There are people in the history of philosophy and definitely in Britain, thinkers, not just uh, philosophers who are taught in academic philosophy courses, but other thinkers who would belong to such a uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. That means, well, we have more work to do. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, David Musgrave, if you were there, it would be lovely to hear from you. Hi, I am here. Can, can, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just interested because um, I'm doing my homework for the Sydney leg of the Biscuit King peregrination. Uh, and um, I, was, I had been reading Mary's book on science and poetry. And I was interested to see that it was more about, the, the focus was more on science, less on poetry, which is understandable. But what poetry was mentioned was from, from an English and an Anglo-Saxon tradition, which is very much uh, for a long time being concerned with rationality, with coherence. And even when it's concerned with irrationality, it does so in a very coherent and logical way. Whereas many other poetic traditions on the planet um, are quite different and I was, and they seem to represent a different idea of poetry, perhaps to what Mary was referring to. And I was just wondering to what extent Mary was aware of the English tradition being quite specific and other traditions and other movements in other languages, such as surrealism or symbolism or the radical indirectness of uh, Tang and Song dynasty, Chinese poetry, whether they in themselves, relative to the English tradition, offer up quite radical uh, alternatives? Great question. Um, if also, Ian Kidd might want to come in on this. Uh, you, you might have some thoughts, Ian. I should say, by the way, I didn't realise David Musgrave is our Tokyo Biscuitin, or our Sydney Biscuitin Sydney, poet. Next station. <laughs> yeah, next <there's> leg. <laughs> <laughs> He's very naughty to bed. Uh, um, does Ian, Ian, do you want to add something? If not, I have a, I have a very quick comment. I, I think I... Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, so what I wanted to say is the it's, way... I, I, so, then you, um, is it... I, I'll just quickly say this and uh, and Ian can add something or and yes you're right um, so I think the um, the book is very interesting in that sense then why why Mary um, draws so heavily on the English romantics in my reading was because that period so a lot of very fast industrialization and suddenly people realized that science that was there before, you know, maybe 200 years ago, the mechanics or the optics, that started to be applied by the business people, the engineers of the age, the uh, government, the local um, nobility, 
to in-house production, the factories were built and so on. And so the poets um, engage very actively suddenly with, oh my God, science can have this disturbing uh, effect. And they saw that, okay, science transforms work, it transforms money, it transforms power, and it started to have its own ideology. So um, there were many people who were um, touting this uh, reformative um, uh, capacity of science and the idea that it can replace um, also not it, it is not only a way to enhance our technology and production but also it can provide like a vision that can replace all the visions of what human life is or, or how society should work how we should understand humanity society and i think she sees in the romantics because they are at that part, very particular historical moment uh, an interesting potential to engage with this um but I, I think at the same time, she's definitely a pluralist. So I, I would also be interested in what other people think about what, what Mary would say on uh, what we can draw on from other poetic traditions, because I think she would be someone who would say, of course, there are many and, and we should learn from it. Um, sorry, guys, I'm just wondering, because I'm just looking at the time now. Sorry, that All was right. excellent. We, we just, just, we're running over and I know that there are more questions in the comments. Um, but perhaps we should um, just continue with your program, the, what you were thinking, your original schedule with Yoshihiro. What do you think? Um, so we, I think we only have a, a short poem left, right, at the end. Mm -hmm. um, Yoshihiro, are you okay if we say, if we allocate eight minutes, then we round it out to one hour 15. So we do maybe one more question and then we get to the poem. Is that okay? Great. That sounds great. Yeah. And just at the end, I'd just like to say, or Rachel would like to say, one of us will say uh, just one or two words. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Thank uh, you. Really so I just there's quite a few comments. There was, um, I don't know if Elvira is still there, if she would like to say something. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, from Munich, hello. Uh, I'm not very familiarized with the work of Mary Mitchley, but um, I recently started to read about her due to a uh, famous and wonderful poetrist, a female folk poetrist named uh, Daja Maria Kushukaru. And she um, made uh, a workshop where we try to understand some of the thoughts of Mary. And what I would like to add is um, the um, quality of um, poetry in combination to music because even if I don't understand something uh, I really get the idea for instance I got what is the tone what is the um, the the rhythm what is the culture uh, anybody speaks like you did before for instance as you talked about um, your uh, dead father I understood perfectly what you meant because um, to me poetry has this quality of being on the one side as semantic like music but on the other side even uh, metaphoric and the metaphoric um, idea is what makes it complex that's why you can't translate something but only transcreate. And that's what I think is the most interesting in poetry. And that's why it always, during the whole history, to my little understanding, has been there, even in um, terms of um, the most, let's say, in the Enlightenment, um, where we come, came, in, in, in Europe at least, uh, from a tradition of um, a really poetic, um, uh, how can I put it, a poetologic uh, referral, which began to disturb afterwards uh, as a subject uh, understanding uh, evolved. But before it was like how it, uh, more in the so, uh, way of rhetorics uh, um, of, of building a poem. And now what is um, to me the most interesting is that even um, the, complex, the complexity of um, the myths, uh, is it myth? No, the mystic, um, is something which is genuine based on, um, on on a different, on a whole way of speech, understanding something which is dark and, uh, what is the opposite, uh, enlightened. <laughs> this is only able if you are able to get more of the only logic understanding. 
And I'm totally aware that logic is something linear and that poetry maybe is something circular. I'm not even uh, convinced. It may be even spiralic or whatever. I don't know, but uh, that's what I thought. And um, thank you very much. I, I'm very happy that I didn't bought some uh, presents for my family. They will be very disappointed about that. <laughs> So I got a very big present of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you so much. I think it, it's been a present for all of us. And um, yeah, this this last idea about the shape of these things, whether they're linear or spiralic, or I think that's something I loved. I need to think about too. Um, Istvan, do you want to take the right take over now? Yeah. Thank you, so... everyone, for your comments and questions. And I'm sorry I've missed uh, some people off. Thank you so much to everyone and thank you Claire for sharing. Thank you Rachel for helping us set up. Um, and most of all, of course, thanks to Mary who uh, with her wonderful work inspired us and enabled it. And uh, actually what we would like to do as a little closing act would be reading out one more poem. And if I am correct, yes, we already wrote this to Mary. Yes, Tetsugaku to shi. Mary Misery ni. Tetsugaku ga watta tokoro kara shi wa hajimaru. To itta no wa Auschwitz o iki nobita shi jin. Tashka ni sou yu koto mo aru daro. Daga, Tetsugaku no temae de tachi domatte iru shi mo aleba. Shi no tae da ato no sekai o souzo suru Tetsugaku da te aru kamo shire nai. 缶入りビスケットを愛した人の哲学は、人と共に午後を過ごす。観念よりも、一人の生きた人間にお茶を入れてもらって。窓の外では、鳥が飛び立つたびに、木の小杖と空の深みの境目が溶けて混じり合う。日が暮れると、死は帰ってゆく。言葉の井戸の底で、死者たちの声を聞くために。哲学は、ビスケットの缶をしまって、私たちの方に向き直り、生きるための知恵について語り始める。And so the English reads, philosophy and poetry, to Mary Midgley. Poetry starts where philosophy ends, said a poet who survived Auschwitz. It could be so, but there is also poetry that stops in front of philosophy, or philosophy that imagines the world after poetry disappears. Philosophy of someone who loved the biscuit in a tin spends the long afternoon with poetry. A living human being, not abstract idea, serving tea for them. Outside the window, as the birds fly up, the boundary between the trees twigs and the depth of the sky melting into each other. When the sun is down, poetry goes back to its house at the bottom of the well of words and listens to the voices of the dead. Philosophy puts her biscuit in a way, turns to face us, and starts talking about the wisdom for living. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. So um, thank you everyone for joining us and I'll show you the biscuit tin again. It already has yeah. many, many uh, poems in it. And I'll print out Yasuhiro's poems and put them in an envelope and then they will be off to Sydney soon. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to say a word on behalf of, uh, in parenthesis, um, thank you so much to Isfan and Yashihiro for joining in on this lark and for contributing in such a wonderful way. Um, I think we've all benefited a lot and we're going to look forward to reading. I know there's an actual cycle of poems that have come out of your collaboration, which I'm really interested in uh, looking at. I just wanted to let everyone here know that um, there's a poetry competition for children, which is associated with this project. It's called mm. the Young Poets Poetry Competition. It's a global competition open to children. Um, the, the link is now in the chat. 
Um, it'd be brilliant if you could spread the word among your contacts because we really want to uh, try and get it out there. Um, there are some worksheets for children associated with it uh, on Mary's philosophy. And they're in English, um, but yeah they might be of use to, to somebody and um, so do spread the word of that the other thing that we have is um is a networking project called mapping the quartet and i'd really encourage everyone uh that's here if you could go onto that site and add your details what the site is 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 doing is trying to create a network of readers interested in the work of Midgley but also Iris Murdoch, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe and Philippa Foote. And it's not just philosophers, it's poets, it's artists, it's schoolers, it's members of the public, it's anybody with an interest. And we're trying to create this global network. So I'd really encourage you, if you could just go on it uh, today and fill in your details. Lots of us are already there, but it means that we can sort of keep in touch with you and uh, let you know if we've got any uh, further projects that might be of interest and we can, um, also communicate with each other that way as well. And finally, I'd just really like to thank um, Rachel Bollin, who is the project manager of Women in Princess, and she has masterminded the whole um, movement of the Biscuit Tin across the globe. So if she's there, uh, thank you very much, Rachel, from all of us, and uh, have a lovely rest of the evening, everybody, or morning. Rachel. I just wanted to say one more thing, actually, which is, um, there's a really lovely PDF of the correspondence between Isban and Yashihiri that I have managed to upload onto the website during this discussion. <laughs> so if you go on to, um, back onto the Notes from the Biscuit Tin website and onto this Tokyo um, event, um, it's just next to the Japanese translation of Mary's text. So it's on the right hand column there. And that, it contains um, some of the poems that have been read. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, Rachel, and everybody. So. Goodbye. Thank you all. Have a good night or a good day. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Sayonara. <laughs>